Good afternoon. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm going to be presenting a result uh, that we have that uh, shows that quantum clocks or clocks that use quantum dynamics with their full capacity can achieve better accuracies than classical clocks. And this is work uh, that's done in collaboration with Misha Woods, who's in the audience, uh, myself, Gilles Putz, Sandra Stupa, and Renato Rene, all of us at ETH Zurich, the papers on the archive. Um, but some of the work was done while Misha was at UCL London and myself at the University of Geneva. And um, right, so to start off with, I would like to really explain what we mean by a quantum clock because the term clock, stopwatches, time, measurements of time, um, these exist in the literature for decades and by now refer to a variety of situations that are not actually mathematically and conceptually equivalent. So I would like to clarify what I mean by a quantum clock here. Sorry. And what we mean is a self-contained device that autonomously outputs time information, that on its own outputs time information, um, which could be, for example, in the form of ticks. So what I mean is the following. Consider that you have a collection of unordered events. So it could be you have a cup of coffee, one of the talks in the afternoon, a plane landing in Denver, et cetera, et cetera. Then the purpose of a clock is to provide, to provide a sequence of information that we can call ticks and no ticks. So you can think of a clock on a wall, essentially. Every time it goes tick, you have a number that goes one, two, three, four, et cetera. And if for a large amount of ticks, you can have minutes and hours. And the result of having all of these ticks is the following. Now you can place these events with respect to the ticks. So it may be that the clock is good enough that you can differentiate E2 from the collection of E3 and E4, E1 and E5, and maybe no further, or it may be a better clock that differentiates between all of them. But the important part here is that the clock on its own provides a sort of reference frame for time, just like a ruler provides position reference frames, a clock provides a reference frame for time by outputting ticks on its own continuously. Um, so what is important to differentiate the clock from is what it is not, and that is a stopwatch and a lot of the um, things that are done in metrology. What I mean is the following. So for a stopwatch, a measurement of the state is triggered by external events. So a classic example of a stopwatch could be you start, uh, you trigger a stopwatch when a runner begins a race, you stop the stopwatch when the runner completes the race, and then you measure, and the stopwatch essentially outputs a time interval between the start to the finish. And so the clock state is triggered by the event start of the race and end of the race. Whereas for um, a cl quantum clock as we consider it, the measurement is continuous and included in the, quantum, in the dynamics of the clock. So the measurement that produces the ticks is already in the continuous dynamics of the clock. So the output of a, of a stopwatch could be any real number, which is a time interval, but the output of a quantum clock is really an integer number of ticks. Or on the most basic level, it's really a bit string of whether the clock has ticked or not. And the differences that this causes is, most importantly, for a stopwatch, the dynamics can be unitary meaning that between the triggering of measurements by external events, the stopwatch on its own can evolve unitarily uh, with quantum dynamics, but a quantum clock as we consider it must continuously output ticks to a register and therefore by definition is an open quantum system. And what this means when studying clocks on a technical level is that unlike in the case of stopwatches where you choose the measurement essentially to optimize the estimation of the state, so it's really a state estimation problem, for the case of quantum clocks, you have to choose the measurement to both optimize the state, uh, sorry, optimize the estimation of the state, but also to minimize the disturbance to the dynamics. Because this measurement is a continuous measurement that is included in the dynamics, so if you choose a very strong measurement that provides the best state estimation, you might disturb the dynamics of the clock, which wouldn't give you a good result. And at the same time, the one that minimizes the disturbance to the dynamics is a trivial measurement, which will of course give you no information about time. And so the result of all of this is that um, there really are different devices conceptually and when you see, when you look at the quantum over classical advantage that also exists for stopwatches, they are with respect to different parameters. So for stopwatches it's typically with respect to the number of database, uh, sorry, not stopwatches, but in metrology, it's typically with the number of database queries or the number of systems, whereas in quantum clocks we will really see that the advantage is with respect to the Hilbert space dimension of the clock. Okay, so with this I come to what a uh, technical formulation of a quantum clock is, and this is really the most complicated equation that you will see in the talk, but it is also actually conceptually simple. So 
because a clock has to output to register, it's represented simply by a map from the clock to a clock and a register. And really, there is um, the simplest form of a register is a single bit, which can be in a state 0 or 1. Anything else more complicated is just post-processing. A 0 indicates that the clock hasn't ticked. A 1 indicates that the clock has ticked. And so what this map corresponds to for a small amount of time is, well, this is the, the part where nothing has happened. Then there is a part which is what we call the no-tick Limbladen, which essentially is the internal dynamics of the clock that does not generate any ticks. So it's attached to 0 of the tick register. And this is just arbitrary open quantum system dynamics involving a Hamiltonian and some Limbladen operators. And the other part, which is we call the tick Limbladen, is really an arbitrary quantum measurement. As you can see here, this is a um, completely general quantum channel that generates a tick onto the register. And this, is, um, this essentially is a, a way of writing it to first order, because the, the correction term in this is second order in delta, where delta is a small time of evolution of the clock. And so. Yeah, so to recap on the, the parts, this is a map from clock to register because it must inf emit information to the outside world. These are arbitrary dynamics, and this is an arbitrary measurement. However, for our um, problem, we really wanted to just show a quantum to classical advantage. So we will take classical dynamics to be completely general. So we'll take the most general classical dynamics that is associated with this. But for the quantum case, since we only need to prove an advantage, we will actually take a simple case that suffices for us, which is, um, first of all, to focus on a single tick of the clock, so to, to take the clock as um, a reset clock, which essentially means that after every tick, the clock returns to a fixed state that is the same, regardless of what its state before the tick is, which results in an IID sequence of ticks. And then the, the information encoded in the entire sequence of ticks is encoded in a single tick of the clock. If you do this, then the full dynamics of the measurement doesn't matter. You can simply take the entire POVM element that the sum of all of that. So it's really just the probability uh, of ticking that matters. And another simplification is that we will not need the entire Limbladen for the internal dynamics. We can keep that zero and just include a well-chosen Hamiltonian that I will come to later. And with that, this whole um, dynamic simplifies very simply to, oh, oh there it is. <laughs> Wait now. Yes. <laughs> um, Right, it simplifies to a, to a modified Schrodinger equation, which is just Schrodinger's equation with an imaginary potential. So what this is really is that is the Hamiltonian is the internal dynamics of the clock, and the imaginary potential uh, represents a probability per unit time that the clock ticks, in which case the norm of the state will disappear. And, the, and ex exactly that norm of the state disappearing is the probability per unit time of ticking. So this tau refers to the property density of the clock ticking, and it's basically proportional to the expectation value of this potential, V. So V is, um, v is a positive operator, but it, it, it appears in Hamiltonian as IV, so it's an imaginary potential. Right. Yes, as V is an absorbing potential. OK, so now that we have the technical formulation of a clock, we want to really understand the statement quantum clocks are better than classical, for which we have to do two things. We have to identify what is the resource that we provide both the quantum and the classical clock, and then how we quantify the accuracy of clocks in general. Our focus is information theoretical, so we really take the Hilbert space dimension that the clock has access to. So in the, in the previous Limbladian, we really take the Hilbert space on which Limbladian acts. Um, out of interest, there is, this is not a focus in our paper, but you could also look at the energy of a clock. Uh, one trivial thing that you could do with energy is to scale up the frequency by just taking, taking a Limbladian, scaling up all of the energies by a constant factor, which just makes all of the dynamics faster. But something more interesting that you can look at is to take a thermodynamically autonomous clock, that is one that is powered only by heat, and then ask what is the heat required or the entropy generated generation required for the clock to be so and so accurate. And this is done in this uh, paper, in earlier paper, which is published now in PRX. Um, but yeah, for us, we will really take only the dimension. So we do not care about the heat generated and how much it costs to make the state or the dynamics of the clock as we like, but just uh, the dimension of the clock itself. And on the other hand, we have to talk about the accuracy of the clock. And we will take, for us, the accuracy to be this ratio r, which is, so if you take the probability distribution of the clock ticking in time, the delay function of a single tick, then you simply look at the mean of that delay function and the variance of that delay function. You take the ratio, the mean squared to sigma squared. Um, the reason for, for this is that this r is actually the answer to the operational question, 
how many ticks does the clock output before the uncertainty in the next tick is actually the interval between ticks. So for a watch on my hand, it will be how many seconds before the clock's inaccuracy is actually one second. So it's a very natural quantity uh, to look at for clocks. And it has the advantage of being scale invariant. So if you take t to at, you, you get um, the same answer, which means that it doesn't matter whether the clock is fast or slow. You're always measuring the accuracy with respect to its own time scale. Another different measure that you could look at, which is more operational in some sense, because it doesn't depend on background time, is the number of alternate ticks that you could get by taking two imperfect clocks and playing them against each other with the condition that they would succeed as long as the ticks from one are alternate with respect to the other. This was introduced um, in this paper by Sandra Yongcheng and Renato, which is also somehow the paper that clarified conceptually um, the notion of a, uh, a self-contained quantum clock as an independent reference frame for time. OK, so now that we've introduced the resource and the accuracy and the technical formulation, let's take the most trivial case. Um, which is a one-dimensional clock. So a one-dimensional clock, quantum, classical, it doesn't really matter, it's the same. It's represented by a single number, which is just um, a single pr positive parameter lambda, which is just the property per unit time that the clock ticks. And because it's one-dimensional and time independent, this is really a zero information clock. The property per unit time of ticking is independent of what has happened previously. And this is equivalent to, say, radioactive decay, for example, follows this law. And if you take the delay function that you get out of such a clock, it's really just an exponential decay. And then you can straightforwardly calculate the mean, the second moment, the variance. And you end up with an accuracy that is the, the ratio mu squared by sigma squared. It is exactly one. So this is really what we would call the, the trivial clock. Um, interestingly, one thing that you could do with this clock, uh, quite trivially, is to post-process many ticks in the sense that I can have such a clock working in the background. But instead of counting each tick of this clock as one, I wait for 100 of them, and then I count that as one tick. And what this means is, um, on a mathematical level, the delay function of one post-process tick is now going to be the convolution of the delay functions of all of the little ticks that I bunch together. And that leads, it's very simple to show that that leads to an accuracy, this ratio of mu squared by sigma squared, that scales as n times the original accuracy. So just the number of ticks that I bunch together times the original accuracy. So it's really a case of trivial signal-to-noise manipulation using the fact that the signal goes as n and the noise goes as square root of n. And the first um, the half, like one part of uh, the major results of this paper is that the optimal classical clock is actually no better than post-processing. So what do I mean by a classical clock now? So we take the Limbladen that we had originally, but we restrict the dynamics to diagonal states in a fixed basis. So we choose any arbitrary orthogonal basis, but we uh, limit now the state and the Limbladen to be such that you always remain diagonal in that basis. And if you do this, you end up with stochastic dynamics on population vectors, meaning that you can simplify from working on density matrices to working on just a probability vector in real dimensional space. Um, your delay function and the rate of change of this vector, the dynamics of the clock and the delay function, then simply become a matrix times your, your state. And these matrices are just, uh, the, the dynamics is a Kolmogorov generator, and the, the tick generator is just a positive matrix. And by positive, I mean element-wise positive because it generates probabilities. So if you do this, you can really then analytically optimize to find what the best possible classical clock is, which is what we did. And we found that the best clock is what is so-called the ladder clock, which is very simple. You take um, the clock to start in one of the pure states in this orthogonal basis. The dynamics is simply to jump from one state to the next. There's a property per unit time of moving to the next state. And then the tick is generated from jumping from the last state in the sequence back to the first state. So you go from E1 to E2 to E3 all the way to ED. And then you jump from ED back to E1 and you generate a tick. And this really is, as you can recognize immediately, is again bunching together ticks. So what the ladder clock is doing is really taking each one of these states as a mini tick, but only outputting one tick when you go through the entire sequence. And so it follows again mathematically that the accuracy will scale as D times so where d is the dimension now of this ladder clock um, times the accuracy of a, a single tick, which is again r is equal to 1. So the end result of this is that a, the best possible classical clock can give an accuracy of r is equal to the dimension of the clock. And so now the big question is, can quantum dynamics do better? And before going into the technical details, there is a simple argument for why you could expect that it could do better. So 
incoherent dynamics, which is what we have in the classical case, is like a, is, well, it is not like, it's actually really a biased random walk in the sense that um, there's a property per unit time to go from one state to the next. So you end up spreading as you move between the states. And although the signal, or rather the position of this, the center of the distribution moves as time, you always have that the noise will spread as square root of time. And so in the end, you end up, oops, sorry. Oh, that's a mixture. Yeah. You end up with the same ratio t upon square root of t as a signal to noise ratio as you would do when you just bunch ticks together, which is an explanation for why the classical and post processing are really the same. However, quantum mechanics has the possibility of not spreading as much. And I say the possibility because it's not so, um, it's not straightforward. But imagine as a thought experiment that you had no spread at all. So you had a Hilbert space of dimension d and you were able to move the state from one end to the other without having any spread. So then you could expect that if there are d states and you do this, you go take the clock from one to the next and ticking from the last, then the mean will go as the number of states that you have to go through. But the uncertainty in this thought experiment is just one because it's just the, you, you need to have an uncertainty of the order of one because while moving from one state to the next, you have to do so continuously. But you can have it as small as one. And then you could expect that the, then in this case, the ratio mu squared by sigma squared would be d squared. So now the question is, can we actually get to d squared? Is this possible? And to do so, we would need a clock somehow that actually mimics this. It's able to move without spreading. And this is um, the, what, I, what we have called the quasi-ideal clock. We introduced it in, um, actually in a different context, in the context of unitary control. Um, and it's recently published in the French mathematical journal, Annales Henry Poincaré. Um, and it's by Misha, myself, and Jonathan Oppenheim. And what it does is very simple. The Hamiltonian of this clock is the salica wigner Hamiltonian for quantum clocks. It's just a bounded harmonic oscillator. So it's equally spaced ladder. The typical states that you consider for such a Hamiltonian are these states that were studied by Perez in 1989, which are mutually unbiased with respect to the energy eigenstates. And they have the property that if you start in one of these, ang like these, um, I will call them angle states, theta, then you move in discrete un intervals of time to the next angle state and so on and so forth until you return back to the same one. So if you start at theta one, you will go to theta two, theta three, all the way to theta one, two, and back to theta one. Unfortunately, for quantum dynamics, they also have the property that they fluctuate in between these specific intervals of time. And the fluctuation is actually quite large. It's on average square root of the dimension, which if you remember is actually as much as the classical noise. And therefore, we would not expect that if we use these states, even though they are some of the most common states in, used in the literature, that we would get a quantum advantage because in the end, the noise is actually as much as classical. But this is where the quasi-ideal clock comes in. Rather than start with a Perez state, we start with a Gaussian over the Perez state. So it's a coherent state that's a superposition of many of these Perez states. And what this does is it trades off width and stability. So the Perez state has the property that it starts precisely defined but fluctuates wildly, whereas the Gaussian can start not so well defined but remain quite stable in time. And so now the, the question is, can we somehow pick a width that is, remains, that is initially small, but also remains small in time? And so we have to optimize now the state and the potential V for the case of the quantum clock. And going by the same thought experiment, if we manage to pick an uncertainty in the state and the potential of the order of d to the eta, so of course, eta being zero is the ideal case because that's sigma of order one. Um, then we would expect a ratio r of d to the two minus two eta. So now the operative question is how small can eta be? And clearly if we pick it to be too small, so if we try to pick eta to be zero, then we end up with a Perez state, an eigenstate, but we know that this fluctuates by square root of d. If we pick it to be too large, then we've already lost because we've picked eta to be too large. And this is sort of a, a diagram that shows that it's actually possible to, to choose eta well. So if we choose eta to be, so if you choose actually the initial state to be an energy eigenstate of the clock, which is one that has a spread over all of the angle states and of course remains constant in time, then of course this defeats the purpose because it's too large. If we try to pick the Perez state, then of course it starts at zero, but it fluctuates wildly uh, in between. But it is possible to pick an intermediate value which is both less than the, what you would get for energy eigenstate, as well as fluctuating very little. And this is only for d is equal to eight, so for higher dimension it becomes much, much more accurate. And the answer to the question, how small can eta be, is actually as small as we like. And this is really the, the major uh, result on the quantum mechanical side, that via a good deal of functional analysis, you can choose a potential with respect to dimension, 
as well as choose a state that scales with respect to dimension in such a way that eta can be made as small as one likes as long as you are allowed asymptotically large dimension d. So the more precise statement would be that for every epsilon greater than zero that you pick, you can construct a family of clocks with respect to dimension using the quasi-ideal clock such that the accuracy r is always greater than the order of d to the two minus epsilon, which therefore concludes a quadratic advantage for quantum clocks over classical clocks. Oh. Right, so uh, just um, a quick glance through some representative results. So of course for d is equal to one, it was kind of trivial, quantum and classical makes no difference. For d is equal to two is actually the cleanest result possible. Uh, the classical result, of course, is that r is bounded by two. Quantum mechanically, it turns out that the maximum r is exactly four, so it's not um, an approximation, you get exactly four. And the, the clock is actually quite simple. So this is the block sphere representation of a qubit, a spin half particle. The internal dynamics of the clock is just a Hamiltonian in the z direction, which means that if you start with a state in the x direction or anywhere on the equator, you would simply process about the z axis. Um, and the potential that generates ticks is, is somewhere on this equator. So you can think about it as you're processing on the equator and every time you pass one of the eigenstates of, of, the, um, of x, you generate a tick. And you can calculate the delay function analytically, you get exactly four. Then when you look at slightly higher dimension, you see that the quasi-ideal clock, as expected, beats the Perez states. So this is the classical bound, which is just r is equal to d, the orange line. The Perez states, they start off as at r is equal to four for d is equal to two because for qubits it's kind of trivial. But then as you see, it doesn't really do better than a linear scaling. Um, whereas the quasi-ideal clock already shows a better than linear scaling. And in fact, for much larger dimensions, you can see that, um, so for instance, all the way up to d is equal to 100, you get a r of 6,000, which is much greater than 100, which would be the classical bound. And even if you look at this as r as a, as a power of dimension d, that power starts to approach two or r as a constant times d squared, that constant starts to approach one. And out of interest, if you, if you look at the width of the state and the potential that you have to choose in dimension d is equal to 100 to, to get this result, it turns out to be of the order of 2.94. So it's not a delta function, but it's still rather well, quite thin. Right. Um, so yeah, so a, a simple summary of the whole result would be that if a quantum and classical clock both use a Hilbert space of dimension d, and the output ticks, then the accuracy r of the classical clock is upper bound by d, and the accuracy r of the quantum clock can be made to scale pretty much quadratically. Um, and so to end, I would just mention some ongoing work and future directions that some of uh, us are doing, uh, extending this work. So the first is uh, a project by um, Misha Woods and, and Alvaro Alhambra, who's also here, on uh, applying clocks to quantum information processing. And what they've shown is, so there is the Easton and knill nogo theorem for quantum error correcting codes, which implies that in a finite dimensional Hilbert space, there exists no perfect code for transversal gates. If you had perfect clocks, which requires infinite dimension, then of course you get a perfect quantum error correcting code. But then the intermediate question is, of course, the interesting one. If you have an imperfect clock, then how good can this error correcting code for transversal gates be? And they found a a correspondence between these two questions, how accurate the clock is and how good can the error correcting code be. And it also is interesting that they all find a difference between the quasi-ideal clocks and the salica wigner perez clocks as we do in, in the work that I've talked about. In the sense that for quasi-ideal clocks, you get the fidelity of the, the code that the, the error in the fidelity is one over d squared, where d is the dimension of the clock, whereas for the Perez clocks, it goes as one over d. Um, another direction that we've been going um, in, at ETH Zurich is to, to find an information measure to unify accuracies because somehow we look at now a clock as something that extracts information about background time and outputs it to the out, outside world. And if this is the case, then all of these different accuracies should actually be all facets of some sort of information measure. So we look at if you take the output of a collection of clocks, what is the information contained in them? And we have a result which is based on a simple relative entropy between the output of clocks with respect to Poissonian clocks, the one-dimensional random clocks I talked, out, talked about before. And as, um, as one example of why it is fundamental, this actually upper bounds both the number of alternate ticks you could get as well as the regularity r. So it's somehow it's a unifying information measure. And this is work with Leonard Baumgartner who's doing his master's project on this topic at ETH Zurich as well as Gilles, uh, myself, Henrik Wilming, 
Yu Xiang Yang, who's also in the audience, and Renato Renner. Um, another interesting direction, um, which is a project led by Yu Xiang, um, also involving Leonard, myself, and Renato, is to take quantum clocks in sequence and show a quantum enhancement. So, it's, yeah, sorry, just about to finish. Um, which is so all of the work I've talked about before uh, in this in this talk is a self-contained clock, but you could also consider that a clock receives an imperfect time input and then uses its, its internal dynamics to generate a better output. And what uh, we've shown in this work is um, is that for a quantum clock receiving an input, uh, an imperfect input, it can pretty much ensure that the output is the multiplying uh, of the accuracies of the input and the accuracy of a clock, the clock itself. So the accuracy of the output is the product of the input accuracy and the clock accuracy, which is not possible if the clock is classical, because you're not able to use unitary dynamics to your advantage there. And with that, I would conclude the talk and refer to these papers. Um, this is uh, the work that I've talked about. Um, then there's also the work on thermodynamically autonomous clocks that I referred to, the, the work that introduced quasi-ideal clocks for quantum control, and finally the, the work that um, talks about the alternatics game and the conceptual nature of clocks as reference frame for time, which is by Sandra, Yongsheng Liang, and Renato, um, and that's this one here. And yeah, thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Ralph. Any questions, Brent? Thanks for the talk, very nice. Uh, so let me say that uh, I understand that you're quantifying how costly is your clock uh, by means of the dimension of the Hilbert space in which the clock works, right? So I would say that a honest measure of how costly is a clock would, would be also the energy or some energy scale that you are consuming in order to, I don't know, to, uh, to have this clock uh, working on. So, yes. So can you comment something on that? Yes. Um, so that was the purpose of the comment in the mi middle of the talk. So the trivial way to consider energy is to just scale up all of the energies. But this is not interesting. It just makes it faster, but doesn't change accuracy. The non-trivial way is to really consider where this energy could be drawn from. And this is the purpose of the work on thermodynamically autonomous clocks. So there we don't start with a clock that's already perfectly designed. You have to really draw on heat from two baths to run the clock. And there you, g you do get a result. So the result there is that the accuracy of the clock seems to be linked fundamentally to the amount of entropy that must be generated by this process, the heat flow between the baths. And without a certain entropy, you would not get an accuracy. But it was, it's for a specific model in that paper. And one of the open questions of this work is somehow to generalize this conjecture to a, a statement for all clocks, that you need a specific amount of entropy and heat for a certain amount of accuracy. But that's not considered in this paper here. No. Thank you. Any more questions? I have one. Uh, can you go back to the technical slide with where you wrote out the, the operator with the Limbladian? The Limbladian. Yeah. That might take a while. Oh. Yep. Yeah. Um, so. What are the J operators exactly? How do you... Like ah, um, so the J operators, they are... Um, well, they are, they are arbitrary Krauss operators on the Hilbert space of the clock. They really are arbitrary. So this is... Sorry, the individually the L and the J... Um, yeah, sorry, th this, this really is an arbitrary channel on the clock. So L and J, each of them are families of Krauss operators that are valid quantum channels. But then and isn't the V always the identity if those are cross operators? Um, isn't that exactly the completeness relation? Yes, no, sorry. Um, or do you want a unital channel so that? No, sorry, the L and J, sorry, the L and J are cross operators, yeah, sorry, they, do, they, do not, they do not sum to be a channel. So in the Limbladian representation, you have a family of cross operators but they do not, um, the sum of them is not uh, a channel, indeed, it's sorry. It's a trace non-increasing. It's, it's not a trace non-increasing -incre operator, yeah, indeed. And, okay. and, in, and somehow, actually, in this case, um, when you take the continuous limit of this, this becomes a generator of probabilities rather than a POVM element itself, like V. So it's, it's not even, 
like V can be very large then because it's it's a generator rather than the actual POVM element. Yeah, but indeed it's not a, the sum of the J's is not a full channel. Yeah. And then different choices of those channels would correspond to different physical implementations of the clock or. Yes, uh, indeed. So, so typically for the, for the quasi-ideal clock, if you think about it as, a, as states on a circle, then these measurement operators would really correspond to um, a high probability of, uh, not projectors, but a region of at some point in this circle of states where you would measure a tick, whereas the rest would be zero. So it would be, yeah. So J really encodes physically where in the Hilbert space the clock, is, the clock generates ticks. Yeah. Thanks. Any more questions? If not, let's thank Rob again. Thank you.